How are you guys doing this morning? All right. Surely it's better than that. From up here, it sounds like... If you have not already done so, go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. As uh, Jenny just read for us, we'll be covering uh, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to be bringing the fifth, the fifth message in our Unity in Action series as we preach through the book of Ephesians on Sunday mornings. Before I get into the message, uh, I want to give a, uh, a public service announcement, though. Uh, <clears throat> it is the hope of everybody who preaches here on Sunday mornings, Todd Malone, our lead pastor, Adam McMahon, our executive pastor, myself, and, and uh, whoever else uh, is up here on a Sunday morning. It is our hope that when you're sitting out there listening and, and watching us go through the passage, that you're able to see the ideas and the conclusions that we get directly from the text. Our, our aim is to explain God's Word. That's the essence of expository preaching. We're not trying to come up with new ideas. We're not trying to find an ingenious angle on a passage that no one has seen before. Uh, we're simply trying to expose the Word as it was given to us. And I say that because the, the way that we preach our sermons should be, and I, I hope and pray that it is, it should be a model for all of you for how to interact with and handle God's Word. So uh, I only say that just to, to remind you that you should be able to look at how we're doing things and then in your own personal Bible study be able to use the same kind of methods and approaches that we use as well. <clears throat> So our hope and prayer is that the sermon is instructive on two levels. You know, one, the explanation of the text itself, and then secondly, leading uh, you, the congregation, in how you interact with God's Word and how you handle it. So just keep that in mind as you listen, and uh, maybe that'll help a few more of you stay awake. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I don't think... Well, I can think of a couple times when somebody's fallen asleep, but they had an excuse. They were tired. Okay, so we'll go ahead and begin. Uh, on April 21st, 1986, <clears throat> nearly 30 million people tuned in to watch a live broadcast called The Mystery of Al Capone's Vaults. How many of you guys remember that? I was one of those 30 million people tuning in with uh, excitement and bated breath to see what would happen. Uh, the, the show centered around the opening of a secret vault that had been discovered in the Lexington Hotel, which had been owned by Al Capone who, of course, was long since dead by this point. Uh, the show was hosted by newsman Geraldo Rivera, and he was there to help build the suspense and interest of the audience. Uh, you know, would they, would they find a stash of money that Capone hid away? Would they find bodies or skeletons of his enemies that he had had knocked off? What would it be? And so as they were going through the program live, again, this is live television, they're, they're breaking down this wall to get into this vault. And so uh, while they're doing that to help arouse people's interest and, and keep them really just excited about what was going to happen, he would talk about the history of Al Capone and some of the things that the, uh, the mob did back then. At one point, he, he got to shoot a submachine gun, uh, I suppose just for his own <laughs> enjoyment. Uh, they actually had agents from the IRS on hand to collect any money that they found because even at this late date, Al Capone still owes back taxes, apparently. <laughs> so they were there just in case money was found. And then he had a medical examiner on hand so that if they did find any bodies or skeletons, the medical examiner could, could examine them, you know, find out how they were killed and that kind of thing. Well, when the vault was finally opened, they finally broke through this wall, they found dirt. They found dirt and dirt and more dirt and uh, two or three empty old uh, bottles. So that, that was it. That was all they found in Al Capone's vault. It was an absolute disaster. Uh, just it, Geraldo Rivera, whose career was already in trouble, it was just sent into a tailspin after this thing. Uh, he did eventually recover, I think. He's doing okay for himself now. But the, uh, so right on television, there's this vault. It's a secret vault. There's something behind it. And when it's revealed, absolute disappointment in everybody's minds. The secret that was revealed was just nothing. The secret of Al Capone's vault was that he didn't store anything in his secret vault. There was just trash in there. Now we, we find ourselves to those 30 million, million viewers in the 1980s with this passage in Ephesians because we're standing in front of a secret vault 
that Paul calls the mystery of Christ. And he's going to open the door to that vault. But unlike the viewers then, we're not going to be disappointed. There are indeed great riches in this vault that we call the mystery of Christ. So uh, today's is going to talk about a mystery, but I assure you, you won't be disappointed. We're not going to have dirt and bottles at the end. Now, before I delve into chapter 3, uh, let's get oriented to where we are in the book once again. Uh, this, this helpful chart kind of lays out chapter by chapter what's going on. The first half of Ephesians is primarily doctrinal. It's talking about the truths and doctrines of the Christian faith. And then the second half is primarily practical, meaning it's related to the practice of that faith. So he establishes, this is what God has done, and then he moves on to, this is what you do in response. Last, as you will recall from the second half of chapter 2, was talking about God bringing people near to him and his people that were far off or far away or far out. Through Christ, Gentiles are brought near to God, and they're made a part of God's people. Now, I will add as an aside there are not two ways of salvation. So even an ethnic Jew must be brought near to God and to God's people through faith in Christ. Even though physically they're a part of God's people, they're not spiritually a part of God's people unless they trust in Christ, just like Gentiles. Uh, Jews and Gentiles both are united to God and to one another through faith in Christ. And one of the main points of last week's sermon was that there is no dividing wall between people who are in Christ. If you and another person are in Christ, there should be no dividing wall between you. There's only a dividing wall if we construct it, of course, but God has found the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile in Christ. So God has brought people near. You see the, uh, the fourth section from the right there, made the far off near. And in this section, it talks about God revealing the gospel. Now, I've divided this uh, text today into two parts because of, there are two ideas that Paul is really uh, emphasizing. So uh, let's go ahead and get into it. The first topic in this passage is the mystery of Christ, the mystery of Christ. Chapter 3 begins with Paul's response to that gracious work of God that he described in the last half of chapter 2. So Paul is thinking about what the Lord has done in creating this new man, as he calls it, the church, this new humanity uh, in, in Christ, the body of Christ. He's thinking about that, and he was moved to do something in response, but he doesn't complete his thought. So look with me again at verse He says, For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and then he interrupts that sentence with this long digression that takes up the rest of this section of Scripture. He doesn't complete that thought until verse 14, which you won't hear about until next week. So we actually have a textual cliffhanger here. So come back to hear what Paul was going to do, uh, or you can read the rest of chapter 3 this week as well. It's no crime against that. So this thought that he starts in verse 1 is put to the side, and he doesn't pick it up for a long time because he says something in verse 1 that he feels like needs further explanation. This digression, then, is not out of the blue. It is based upon what he has said. I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and that reminds him, okay, I need to explain that a little bit more. Why, why am I saying on behalf of you Gentiles? He refers to himself, first of all, as a prisoner for Christ. And that is because he was doing Christ's work. He was commissioned by Christ to preach the gospel, to plant churches, to build believers up in faith. And that preaching of the gospel is what brought him into trouble with the authorities. The reason he was in prison, and he's writing this epistle from prison, the reason he was in prison is because he was preaching the gospel. The reason he was in prison is because he was on the mission of Christ. And therefore, he can say, I was a prisoner for Jesus Christ. He commissioned me. I was doing his work. And at the end of this phrase, he adds that, uh, on behalf of you Gentiles. I was a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. And that's because Paul had a specific focus of his mission to Gentiles. At the end of, uh, excuse me, not, whoops. I'll get there in a second. He adds on behalf of you, Gentiles. That's okay, that's good there. Okay, yes, there we go. Uh, so not only was Paul working for the Lord, but he was working for the good of Gentiles, those who were not ethnic Jews, uh, which of course includes everybody in the world except for an ethnic Jew. He was working to bring the gospel to Gentiles. He was working to plant churches among Gentiles, and then he was working to build up the faith of these Gentiles. And these activities are what caused his imprisonment. So that's why he can say, 
I am also in prison on behalf of you. So I, I am working for your good, and this is why I'm in prison. And he's not doing that to make them feel guilty, as we'll see at the end of the, uh, at the passage. He's actually doing that to encourage them to show how much God loves them, that he would actually send Paul specifically to bring the gospel to them. And that phrase is the springboard that brought him into this discussion of the mystery of Christ. So there's a couple of observations I'll make about that, the mystery of Christ. Uh, the first is this. The mystery was revealed by God. A mystery in the context of the New Testament, and uh, I'll, I apologize if Todd covered this a few weeks ago because Paul has mentioned mystery before in the sermon, uh, excuse me, in this book. Uh, but a mystery in the New Testament context is not something that can't be known. Rather, it is more like a secret. It's something that was hidden for ages past, and then now, since Christ has come, has been revealed to us. It isn't, uh, well, that's what I said, yes. And so the sort of, the source of revelation is God himself. Look at verses 1 through 5 once again. For this reason, I, Paul, prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, and then he pauses, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So he begins this digression by talking about the stewardship of God's grace that was given to him for the Gentiles. He was a prisoner for Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles, and then he jumped to making sure that the, they understood that he was given a stewardship by God to bring this grace to the Gentiles. Now this word stewardship, uh, some versions may say commission or dispensation. It refers to the management or the uh, administration of someone else's property. A steward was, was responsible for managing, for dispensing, for caring for the property of his master. And so Paul is saying that God gave him the responsibility to manage, to disperse, to oversee, to dispense his grace to the Gentiles. So that is the stewardship that was given to him. In Acts chapter 9, 15, the risen Lord Jesus said that Paul was a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Of course, Paul did not exclusively carry the gospel to Gentiles. He did preach to Jews as well, but the focus of his ministry was on the Gentiles. <clears throat> and now included in this stewardship that he was given was this thing that he calls the mystery of Christ. Verse 3 says the mystery was made known to him by revelation. Verse 5 adds that this revelation was by the Spirit. And verse 4 says that the mystery of Christ was not made known in the past, but it has now been revealed. It was a truth that was hidden and has been revealed. And as with any spiritual truth, it requires God's action for us to know it. Because we naturally do not possess the faculties to reach into the mind of God and draw out his secrets. God has to choose to reveal them to us. We couldn't know it any other way. And let's praise God for that. Praise God that he did reveal his mysteries to us. Because it's an act of his grace. He's giving us truth about himself and his work that we could not know otherwise. And we didn't... We didn't learn it because we were worthy or because we had done some great thing or because we were deserving, but purely because God chose to bestow that grace upon us. And another implication of the fact that this mystery was revealed by God is that it is therefore true and trustworthy. So what Paul is about to explain about the mystery of Christ, you can stand on, you can build your life around it, you can always trust in it because it was something that was revealed by God. This is not Paul simply reasoning through what he knew and coming to a new conclusion. This is Paul gaining absolutely new truth from Almighty God himself. Being an apostle, God revealed truth directly to him. So the mystery is revealed by God. And the second aspect that's mentioned in this text is that the mystery is about unity in Christ. In verse 6, Paul states exactly what he means by this phrase, the mystery of Christ. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, I already referred to last week's sermon covering the last half of Ephesians 2 about God making a new people consisting of Jews and Gentiles united in Christ. And now Paul circles back around to that truth to say that is the content of this mystery of Christ. That Gentiles who are not ethnically Jewish 
are heirs along with Jews, members of the body of Christ, the people of God along with Jews, and partakers of the promise along with Jews. Now, why would he go back over this ground when just in the previous section he had kind of hammered that home? There's no dividing wall. We're all one in Christ. One of the reasons, I think, is related to these three terms that he uses, co-heirs, co-members, co-partakers. He wants the Gentiles and the Jews to understand that in Christ, yes, you are brought into the family, but you are not second class. You are heir to the exact same inheritance as a Christian Jew is heir to. You are just as much a member of the body of Christ as a Christian Jew. You are just as much a partaker of the promises of God as a Christian Jew. You are not a second class citizen. You are brought in and you are put on an equal plane because all of us are members of the family of God purely on the merits of Jesus Christ. The mystery is that believing Gentiles have the same inheritance of God's riches as believing Jews. Now, in the culture of that day, if you were the eldest son, your inheritance was better than your siblings. You would get the, the lion's share of what your, your uh, father would leave to you. So Paul, by saying that we are co-heirs, he is saying that you're not like the second-born son, okay? You're not like the unwanted stepchild. You are right up there with ethnic Jews who are believers in getting the promises of God and getting the inheritance of God. It is fully and completely yours. And notice that all of these blessings belong to the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, again pointing to the fact that we can't merit it on our own, we can't earn it, we can't fight for it, for it, we can't do anything to gain it except join ourselves to Christ Jesus and fall on his mercy and grace. It is in union with Christ that we enjoy the privileges and blessings given to the people of God. Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is the beloved of the Father. He is the chosen servant mentioned in Isaiah. And he has earned every spiritual blessing that is possible. And when we join ourselves to him, he shares that with us. We become co-heirs along with him and, of course, Jewish Christians. And the way that we come into union with Christ is through the gospel. It is through hearing and then believing in the good news about Jesus Christ. That he lived a perfect life, that he died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins, and that he rose from the dead, giving life and salvation to all who will trust in him. That's how you go from being far off from God to being near to God. That's how you go from being a stranger to the people of God to being a member of the people of God. When Paul says that the mystery is this unity with the people of God that Gentiles experience, he's focusing really on one particular aspect. Because as I mentioned earlier in the book, Paul had used the word mystery, and there are other epistles where he uses that as well, to refer to different truths. So the all-encompassing idea of the mystery of Christ is that it is all the truth about Jesus and what he has done and the implications of those truths for us. <clears throat> It could be said that the mystery of the gospel, to, to summarize it, I suppose, is the gospel and its implications. And in this case, the implication that Paul is talking about or focusing on is the implication that Jews and Gentiles are seen as equal before God and enjoyed exactly the same privilege, privileges in Christ. The mystery of Christ has been revealed. The second idea that Paul expounds in this passage is the ministry of the gospel. At the end of verse 6, he says that people enjoy the blessing of being God's people in Christ through the gospel. Through the gospel. That is how you get to experience the mystery of Christ. That is how you get to live out these glorious promises that he is talking about. It is through believing the good news that we become co-heirs and co-members and co-partakers of the promise. And Paul said that he was made a minister of the gospel and then he gives us some crucial aspects of gospel ministry that I think we can learn from that I want to focus on today. Uh, the first is this. It's a ministry given by God. Look at verses 7 and 8. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given Again, he's talking about the ministry of the gospel. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. 
And then in verse 11, he adds that this was according to the eternal purpose that he, speaking of the Father, has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So just as the revelation of the mystery had to come to us by God, it had to be given to us by God, the ministry of the gospel is also given to us by God. The privilege of being a minister of the gospel is a gift of God's grace. Again, it is not earned, it is not merited, it is never deserved, it is purely a gift of God's grace. And just to underscore that fact, Paul refers to himself as the least, the very least of all the saints. This, uh, the word translated very least, literally means leaster. So it was kind of like Paul is, is just in run around the argument if somebody was like, no, I'm the least. He'd be like, no, I'm, I'm leaster. I'm leaster than you are. Trust me. Paul was always aware of the fact that prior to his uh, salvation, prior to his conversion, he persecuted the church with vigor and with enthusiasm. And so he was always aware that he was above all people. He was unworthy to receive Christ Jesus. He was unworthy to be thought of as uh, a recipient of God's grace. And even, even more highly, how unworthy of, was he to be sent on God's mission to preach the gospel. So he was always cognizant of, cognizant of, <laughs> cognizant. He was aware. He was always aware of it. That's what I should have done. He was always aware of that fact, and it, it humbled him. Uh, but he was, but here, here's one of the reasons that he pointed out that he was the very least of all the saints, okay? Paul wants us to recognize not only, yes, here was a guy who was completely undeserving and God did this for him, but he is nobody special to preach the gospel, to minister the gospel. He's nobody special. He's not some super talented guy. He's not some super intelligent guy. He's not somebody that's except... Un I cannot speak this morning. What's in this water? Perrier. No, I'm kidding. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, Paul. Okay, so he was, not, uh, he was not powerful enough or charismatic enough or gifted enough to preach the gospel to others. His ministry of the gospel was a gift given to him by God. Now, think about this. You... Every one of you that are believers in Christ, you are also the ministry of the gospel. You are given that exact same privilege. It doesn't mean you will stand on a stage and preach a sermon. It doesn't mean you will go into full-time ministry. But in your relationships, in your living of life, you also are commissioned by God as a minister of the gospel. You've been graced to tell others who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Christ died for you. Christ lives. Christ is king. Every person in here that has been born again has experienced those truths. And they can say them with enthusiasm and sincerity. And that is ministering the gospel. These truths are meant to be broadcast and every child of God is given that privilege. Every child of God is given the spirit of God to enable them to be a witness of his resurrection. Gospel ministry is given by God, and it is a grace, and it is something we should be appreciative of. It's not meant to be a chain hung about our neck. It's meant to be a privilege that God has offered to us. Secondly, gospel ministry is a ministry focused on Christ. Look at verses 8 and 9. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to what? To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. The ministry of the gospel is focused on Christ. Paul said that what he was commissioned to do was preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And just think about that phrase for a minute. The unsearchable riches of Christ. What he's saying is that the riches of Christ are boundless. They are innumerable. They are beyond counting. They're beyond comprehending completely. I ran across this quote by an old scholar, W.G. Blakey, who said this about this phrase, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Usually, precious things are rare. Their very rarity increases their price. But here, that which is most precious is also boundless. Riches of compassion and love, of merit, of sanctifying, comforting, and transforming power, all without limit and capable of satisfying every want, craving, and yearning of the heart now and forevermore. 
the unsearchable riches of Christ. This was given to us by God in Christ. And we have the privilege of telling people about this, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Independently of everything else in your life, as a believer, you always have the compassion of Christ. You always have the comfort of Christ. You always have the presence of Christ, the love of Christ, the transforming and comforting power of Christ. It is a ministry focused on Christ, not on us. Gospel ministry is not focused on the pastors of a church. It's not focused on a particular personality. In fact, it isn't even, back in these days, it wasn't even focused on Paul Paul said that he preaches the unsearchable riches of Christ. He doesn't preach himself. He points out how awesome Jesus is, not how you can reach your potential or find success or have a better marriage. All of those things are fantastic and glorious blessings, but they're not the focus of the gospel that we have been given to minister. Remember where Paul was when he wrote this. He was in prison. So he was not experiencing physical comfort. He was not experiencing outward success. But he could be absolutely confident that the ministry of the gospel was still proceeding because the ministry of the gospel is about Jesus. And that is still happening whether Paul is in prison or not. Regardless of your circumstances, the gospel, the ministry of the gospel is still going forward. When a well-known believer commits egregious sin, the ministry of the gospel does not stop. There was a man whose ministry I used to follow on the radio Uh, Many of you may have heard of him, James McDonald. Absolutely loved his preaching. Very solid, very biblical, wonderful expository preacher. He eventually uh, was disciplined by his church for getting into uh, gambling. And then uh, after that, he was removed by his church because he was uh, becoming a bully to his staff and in the church, uh, trying to consolidate all his power. And then to top it all off, they found out that he had hired or tried to hire a hitman for one of his enemies. Okay, now that is an absolutely horrible and unthinkable thing, that whole mess. But when James McDonald fell because of this egregious sin, it did not stop the ministry of the gospel. It did not throw my faith off because my faith is not in James McDonald. I don't preach James McDonald. And when a well-known Christian denies or rejects the faith, it does not stop the ministry of the gospel because it is Jesus that the ministry of the gospel is focused on. And he has come, he has lived, he has died, he has risen, and he's alive forevermore. And that has always been God's plan, to focus on Jesus Christ. That's why he mentions in verse 11, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. Every pastor and elder and deacon and teacher in this congregation will disappoint you at some point. They will fail you in some regard. But Jesus is what we are focused on. Jesus is who we are trusting in. Jesus is who we are putting our faith in. And that is who we pro- preach and proclaim and teach. Verse uh, 12 adds, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Now, this is kind of a, I feel like you just, just sort of an add-on here, but uh, verse 11, he's talking about how, look, all this stuff that's, that's centered in Christ, all of, all of this universe that God has created, it was always aiming toward this end, to unite all things in Christ, Ephesians 1 says. And that's always been God's plan. And then he adds, in Christ, we have boldness and confidence, excuse me, boldness and access with confidence through him. And I think that's just an encouragement that as we're going about ministering the gospel We can rely on being able to go directly to him because of what he has done for us. We can rely on going directly to the Father through Christ with boldness and with confidence. And by the way, this is just an aside here. Paul does asides, I do asides. When you have had a bad day or even a bad week, and by that I mean spiritually bad. Man, you didn't pray all week. You screamed at your wife. You kicked your dog. You were rude to your boss. You double, you, uh, <laughs> so I won't go there. Uh, anyway, you've had a really bad week. Our tendency then, especially when we come here on Sunday mornings, is to be very timid about approaching God. Like, I don't know if I really deserve to sing right now. I don't really deserve to pray. I don't really deserve to take communion. And what God is saying, you can have boldness and access through Christ. So his arms are wide open. He's saying, come to me. Come to me, and I will receive you because of Christ. Because, guys, even on your best weeks, you don't deserve access to the Father. 
So of course on your worst weeks you don't deserve it, but it's always because of what Christ has done for us. Okay, finally, uh, gospel ministry is a ministry that glorifies God. Look at verse 10 again. So that, so all this is happening. He said he's preaching the unsearchable riches of Christ and the mystery of Christ. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, there's a couple of very interesting phrases in this verse. The first is manifold wisdom. How many of you car guys are familiar with a manifold? Well, I'm not, so I'm not going to explain it that way. <laughs> manifold, in this context, manifold means multifaceted or varied. Uh, there was a commentator that I ran across. I love the way he did this. He, re he rewords it as this way, the kaleidoscopic wisdom of God or the polychromatic wisdom wisdom of God to just give you this idea the wisdom of God is so varied and multicolored it's just splendid and glorious to observe so that's the manifold wisdom of God God's multifaceted wisdom all the different aspects in which God is wise and then at the end he mentions the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places now earlier in the book he had also talked about the rulers and the authorities and uh, as Perhaps Todd explained then. I wasn't here that Sunday. I'm sorry, Todd. Uh, I should have reviewed the sermon. That was my fault. As Todd probably explained then, those are classes of angels. So what he's talking about here is that the manifold wisdom of God is being made known to angelic beings through the church. The, now, scholars that I investigated aren't, aren't uh, agreed on whether or not he's talking about fallen angels or unfallen angels here. My tendency would be that he's talking about fall, uh, unfallen angels because the unfallen angels as they see God's wisdom through the church would then erupt in in praise and, and worship of God and I think that's that makes more sense but the point being that uh, the ministry of the gospel causes this wisdom of God to be known in two ways the first is that the church itself proclaims the gospel the church itself proclaims the good news of salvation of Christ and the gospel itself is God's wisdom. I mean, God had this, this group of humanity here, and they're fallen, and they've run away from him. So how can he save them? Would he go to each and every one and try to draw them back to him? No, what he did was had his son become a man and then live a perfect life and die as a substitute for all of these people so that their sins could be, get, be forgiven when they put their faith in him. So that is an aspect of God's wisdom right there. And then secondly, the church, is, church displays God's wisdom as it lives in gospel community. So in this context of Ephesians, when Jews and Gentiles come together to worship together, and they're loving each other, and they're being a part of each other's lives, that is a display of God's wisdom that he was able to bring together these disparate people. And in our case, it would be people who are unrelated to each other, people from different ethnic groups, different backgrounds and cultures who show the love of God to one another, who treat each other as beloved family members. That is displaying God's wisdom to these angelic beings. And since this ministry is for God's glory, then our circumstances do not determine the effectiveness of the ministry because God is glorified even when we're suffering. Verse 13, Paul adds, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So since Paul was in prison, it would be tempting for the believers who had had this letter to be discouraged and think that the ministry of the gospel was being hindered or that the enemies of God were winning. But Paul wants believers to know that suffering, his suffering on their behalf, is actually their glory. Because again, he's in prison because of the proclamation of the gospel, and more specifically for preaching the gospel to Gentiles, which elevates that suffering to a godly sacrifice for their good. So his imprisonment is their glory because it shows how great God's love is for them. That God would have one of his servants risk his own life in order to bring them the gospel. And that in turn glorifies God. So the ministry of the gospel was given to the church by God. It's focused on Christ and it brings glory to God. I summarize the passage this way. God has revealed the mystery of Christ and given the church the ministry of the gospel. God revealed Christ to us. 
And everyone in this room who is a believer has seen Jesus as glorious, as sufficient, as the Messiah, as the Son of God, the Savior and the King. And he has given us the privilege to share that with everyone around us. And by the way, there is, not only is there nothing wrong, but there's something actually very good in sharing the gospel with other believers. And by that, I don't mean reminding them of the whole gospel, which that's not a bad thing either. But I mean, in, 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 I see, I mean... <laughs> I mean, I mean, in a specific situation, I watched Andy Griffith on Friday, it's throwing my accent off. In a specific situation, you share with a fellow believer that aspect of the good news of Jesus that applies to their situation. And that is a blessing. To them, it's a blessing to you. It's an honor that God gives to us. God has revealed the mystery of Christ. He's given the church the ministry of the gospel. Uh, I have a few ways that you can respond to this word from the Lord. I'm actually going to kind of fast forward through the first three because the last one's kind of long. But I will say this, on your bulletin at the bottom of the tear-off portion, there is, uh, these responses are also listed. So if you want to respond specifically and want to communicate that to the church leadership, you can uh, write that down, fill that out, drop it in one of the boxes in the foyer. Those are collected and they will be prayed over this week by the staff. So, uh, okay, let me run through these real quickly. This uh, First of all, you can rewrite Ephesians 3, 1 through 13 in your own words. This exercise helps you to think more deeply about what the text says, and it also helps the truth of the text to stick more firmly in your mind. Uh, you can also tell someone what Jesus has done. Think of something specific that Jesus has done, whether it's something he did while he was on earth or something he's done in your life, and, and tell someone. And again, it can be an, a believer or an unbeliever. Because if it's a believer, it's going to be an encouragement to their soul. Yeah, reminding them of what Jesus has done. That's glorious. And an unbeliever, that helps to point them back to the gospel. Look for an opportunity in a conversation to point to the greatness and goodness of Christ. You can also thank the Lord for his wisdom. Go to the Lord in prayer and thank him that uh, even though he chose to keep hidden so much about Christ for thousands of years that he has now revealed that to us. And now we see this full plan of God unfolded. Okay, so here's the part that's going to take a few minutes. Uh, practice by crafting a three-minute testimony. This week I ran across an article by a group called Team Impact. Uh, they're one of those guys with big muscles that like bend bars around their necks and eat bottles or something. Uh, and they also preach the gospel. And uh, this, I found this article on this Team Impact website about putting together a three-minute testimony, and it was just fantastic. It was just fantastic. So I'm going to run through this uh, real quickly for you. It's a helpful exercise that helps you to focus on what the Lord has done for you, and it gives you a simple way to share your faith. Uh, and by the way, one of the things we, we uh, the teenagers, the uh, senior high anyway, got this uh, last Wednesday. One of the other great things about this is, as opposed to some like pre-printed material that you can get and rehearse, is that this will be your story. This will be sincere and real because it's, it's your story. It's not you just coming up with a bunch of words someone else came up with. So here we go. Uh, Three-minute testimony. Minute number one, life before Christ. So in one minute or less, you share what life was like before you met Christ. Like you could describe what kind of home you grew up in or a significant, significant event in your life. And what you're looking for is to share something that's going to matter in why or how you came to know Christ. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, one might be, this is my story. I grew up in the church, but my faith was not my own. I was in church, but I realized I was not in Christ. Second possibility, you grew up in a family in which you didn't have much, if any, exposure to God. So minute number two. One minute on what made you choose to follow him. So here you're going to articulate the action or the process by which you came to trust in Christ. For some people, it was a specific moment. For some people, it was a process of, of conversation. For some people, they may not even be able to point to any specific area. They're like, I don't know, I was raised in a Christian home at some point. I guess I trusted in him because now I know him. But the main thing is that you communicate that you know who Jesus is and that you're trusting in him because of what he has done. So, uh, for instance, it might be like this. Something happened that made you choose the faith for yourself. Something that made the story of Christ finally sink in. It became your faith and not your family's faith, which was uh, my experience. 
uh, and then for the person maybe who was raised in an un Christian home, something happened that allowed you to encounter God. Maybe you met some friends who invited you to a Bible study or a church service, and there for the first time you heard the gospel message clearly, and the next thing you know, you found yourself responding to the gospel. So this is the, the, the minute number two basically is an encapsulation of how you came to trust Christ. And then minute number three is life since then. So here you want to wrap up what life has been like since you have trusted Christ. Uh, you consider what you've said, and then you bring resolution to that. Now, recognize there may be people in here that are like, man, I was, Russell, how old were you? Six, seven. Russell was six, okay? So he can't say, man, I was in this biker gang. I was doing hard drugs. You know, he can't, he doesn't have that, right? So his life before Christ to life after Christ is, is not as clear. But what, if that's the case for you, what you can focus on just what is life with Christ like? Uh, so for an example would be, though you grew up surrounded by your family's faith, you're now living out your own faith. You're far from perfect, but you make daily choices to live out your faith. You know and are known by the living God. And be upfront when you share with someone that you are journeying. There is nobody on earth who enjoys talking to someone who gives the impression that they are morally superior. Have y'all ever encountered those people? You ever been those people? <laughs> I've been that people a lot of times. Uh, I do that with the teenagers all the time. So you don't want to present that. You don't want to present like, okay, I've trusted Jesus, and man, yeah, all of my bad habits are gone, and I'm just you know, zooming right on, growing spiritually every day. You want to present this as, now I know the Lord. Now I'm trusting in him. He is with me, but I still fail. I still stumble, but I rest on his grace. Now, once you uh, put together that short testimony, you can test it with friends or family members to see if it makes sense, and then you can just use it as the Lord gives you opportunity. Okay, so next week, uh, Todd is going to randomly call on a few of you to give your testimony. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I did joke with the teens about doing that Sunday morning, but I'm, I'm not that, I wouldn't do such a thing. All right, uh, I'm going to pray for us now to, uh, to close this portion of the service, and uh, then I'll dismiss you. And just so you're aware, if you're uh, new here, at the end of service, there'll be people up here around the stage that are ready and willing to pray with you about anything, uh, something about the message, about your own spiritual life, about troubles that you're facing. They would be more than happy to intercede on your behalf uh, to the Lord. So uh, take advantage of that. I, I encourage you. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, the great Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Messiah, the one who brought your plan to completion, the one who brought salvation to all of us, thank you for him, O oh God. And thank you for all these people who have gathered here this morning to worship him, to give him honor and praise, to acknowledge him in what he has done, and to receive his grace and blessings. Lord, I pray for a special measure of grace on every believer in here. I pray that you would use us to minister the gospel. And Lord, when we fail and stumble, I pray that we would fall on your grace and fall on your mercy, recognizing that you receive us even when we screw up. You receive us even when we sin because our access to you is because of Jesus and not because of ourselves. And Lord, I pray that if there is anyone in here that doesn't know you, that your spirit would convince them that they are lost and they are alienated from you. But you have your arms wide open to receive them if they will simply trust in your son and in what he has done. God, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for your mercy and being here among us. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Prayer team, if you'll come on up. And the rest of you, you are dismissed. May God bless you this week.